This is the X28, PowKitty's newest entry into its lineup of Android-based gaming handhelds. It sports a big screen, a big battery, and big performance. And in reviewing this device, I'm put in a kind of awkward position, because it is an extremely flawed device with some pretty unforgivable problems. And despite those, it has become one of my favorite gaming handhelds yet. Let's take a look in this deep dive review of the PowKitty X28. Hello and welcome to RetroBreeze. The PowKitty X28 comes shipped in a pretty typical PowKitty fashion, although this time the box is kind of a dark blue color with flecks of silver foil. I think this is PowKitty's idea of some premium packaging and honestly I find it kind of adorable. Inside the box you'll get the console itself, a USB cable and an instruction manual and that's about it. By the way this device was sent to me for review by MechDIY. You can check them out in the description box below where they sell many different retro handheld gaming devices, including the PowKitty X28. They were also kind enough to send me an official carrying case too, which we'll take a look at a little bit later. And here's the PowKitty X28 itself. And I have to say that this design is incredibly unique looking. I've never quite seen any other handheld like it, including PowKitty's own offerings. It has an angular polygonal design from the front and yet around the back is smooth and curved. And my first impression in the hand is that this thing is incredibly light for its size. And it's also pretty slim for that size as well. And overall, it just seems to be a very pleasing shape to hold. But we'll get back to my full impressions in just a moment. First though, it's time for some speed stats. The PowKitty X28 comes with a tried and true Unisoc T618 processor. This is the same one that's found on the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, the Anbrinic ROG 505 and 405M as well as PowKitty's own X18S. It has 4GB of LPDDR4 RAM, a 5.5 inch screen with a 16x9 aspect ratio which supports 5 point touch, 64GB of onboard storage along with the option to bring an SD card, it has dual front facing stereo speakers, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on board, and has a full dual analog stick layout with two analog sticks, four face buttons, a d-pad, and stacked shoulders. It's 207.6mm wide at its widest point, 80.7mm tall, and 26.9mm thick at its thickest point. However, note that that's the thickest point of the grips. The central section is actually only 16mm or so thick. It has a whopping 5000mAh battery, and includes a 3.5-inch millimeter headphone jack. Bonus features include HDMI output to a TV, peripheral support including controllers via its OTG port, an onboard gyroscope, onboard microphone, and rumble support. The first thing I noticed when picking up the X28 was this unique textured plastic. It's slightly gritty under your hands and you can really feel it, but it's a very comfortable material to grip and I really like it actually. The next thing I noticed is that this thing is incredibly light for its size, coming in at just shy of 300 grams exactly. Finally, I noticed that the controls are very compact, which is kind of similar to the RK2023 that I previously reviewed. The analog sticks, face buttons, and d-pad are positioned pretty high up on the device, which makes reaching them in any configuration extremely comfortable. We'll get back to the controls a little bit later. The front of the device also sports the start and select button, as well as four Android native buttons. This is a really unique feature of the PowKitty X28, which I'll talk about again a bit later on. But suffice to say, these are a lovely addition to have on an Android handheld. And finally, the last element on the front is the dual stereo speakers. Along the bottom, there's nothing but a microphone input, but along the top, you'll find the various buttons, inputs, and outputs that the X28 has to offer. The power button, an SD card slot, a USB-C charging port, HDMI out, an OTG port, 3.5mm headphone jack, and the volume up and down button. And yes, once again, PowKitty has put the volume up and down the wrong way around. Please stop this, PowKitty. It drives me insane. Taking a look around the back of the device, you'll find this shiny silver PowKitty symbol, along with a grill-like texture, which is definitely not an air intake or outtake, it's purely decorative. And then of course, there's these very smooth, well-designed grips that help to make the PowKitty X28 exceptionally comfortable to hold. The design language for the X28 is just kind of different. It's both angular and yet smooth at the same time. It's a fairly large device, and yet everything feels very compact, and it's also very light in weight. And really, this is nothing like anything PowKitty has ever put out before which leads me to speculate that this device may not have been designed in-house by PowKitty, 
Perhaps it was created by somebody else and licensed by them, or maybe somebody on the design team just had very, very different ideas. Either way, it's a very strange device that doesn't really feel or look like anything else out there. And I always like things that are a little bit different, so let's see if the design holds up in the usability. So now let's talk about the controls. The Paukity X28 has a standard dual analog stick layout. And like I said before, the controls are very compact. The analog sticks are a little less than halfway up the device face, and very, very close to the D-pad and face buttons. Uniquely, the shoulder buttons are slanted downwards and away from the device, which in my opinion is an absolute stroke of genius in terms of design, because these are just so comfortable to hold your fingers on. And they bring the shoulders themselves just a bit closer to the D-pad and the face buttons. When you hold this device in your hands, your fingers naturally rest here, and it is supremely comfortable to hold. All of the controls are well within reach, whether you're playing a dual analog stick game, or you're using the D-pad and the face buttons. Speaking of the analog sticks, these are very typical Nintendo Switch style sticks, but they're recessed fairly deeply into the case, which keeps them out of the way if you want to use the face buttons and D-pad. And despite being recessed like this, you still get a full range of motion when pushing on them. They also click down in a nice muted way for L3 and R3. However, the analog sticks highlight the first major flaw on the X28. And that is that whereas they feel just like Nintendo Switch analog sticks, they are not tuned to be like that at all. Let's take a look in a gamepad tester app. And as you can see, when I spin this analog stick, it snaps heavily to cardinal points and diagonals. I don't know whether this is an issue in the software or the firmware, that the sticks are tuned incorrectly, or whether it's the analog sticks themselves. Personally, I'm inclined to believe the latter, because I've gotten cheap analog sticks like this from eBay before, and they acted in a similar way. And unfortunately, this is an issue that's noticeable in-game as well. This is an Android game called Overlight, a simple twin-stick shooter in which you should be able to move and shoot in 360 degrees. But as you can see with the X28's analog sticks, it's more like eight directions. You can really see this issue in action, when I use the laser beam weapon here. This line should move around in 360 degrees, but it really is just snapped to those eight ways. I should also mention that my left analog stick basically cannot reach the bottom left corner. So in many games, I'm stuck without being able to move in that direction or at least struggling to do so. With this issue, it makes it incredibly difficult to get any degree between a cardinal or a diagonal. So if you need high sensitivity, these sticks just aren't going to work. However, I do want to say that whereas I do believe this is a huge problem and I don't really want to justify it, I do think that it's less of an issue than I originally thought it was going to be. I tested this on the best game I could think of, which is Guitar Man on the PSP. In this game, you have to move the analog stick to match the direction of the line. And I didn't really have any problems with this eight-way setup. It's not perfect, and I'm sure I missed a couple of notes here and there because of it. But I don't know, it's a huge problem, it's a massive flaw, but it's not exactly game-breaking, at least in my opinion. I am planning to replace these analog sticks with some gully kit hole sensor sticks instead, so we'll see in a future video whether that will fix them. Be sure to subscribe if you're interested in seeing that. Oh, and just for comparison, here's an external controller connected to the X28 and how it reacts in the gamepad tester app. As you can see, there's no cardinal snapping here at all. So anyway, there's the very flawed analog sticks. But what about the face buttons? Well, I'm happy to say that the face buttons on the X28 are some of the absolute best I've had the pleasure of using on a retro handheld yet. They're a compact size and have a unique glossy texture. They use a rubber membrane connection and have a very nice amount of spring back after you push down on them. They don't go flush with the case and are overall just really, really excellent face buttons. I've had no issues with ghost inputs or missed inputs or anything else. In addition, for me personally, I just absolutely adore that these are in an Xbox layout and not a Nintendo layout with A on the bottom and B on the right. I just really love everything about these buttons, and the closest comparison I have is the Steam Deck face buttons. These are just really nice overall. So now it's time to talk about the D-pad, and oh boy do I love this D-pad. It's slim with a similarly glossy texture, and feels absolutely great under the thumb, thanks to the depression in the middle that helps to keep your thumb centered. It's really, really easy and comfortable to slide between the different directions on this D-pad. And were it not for another minor flaw here, I would say that this is a top tier D-pad. But that flaw that holds it back just a little bit is of course cardinal tilt. This means that if you hold your finger down on one direction, and then tilt to the perpendicular directions, those will be picked up in your game. In Crash Bandicoot, this means that Crash will tend to drift to the left and the right and move diagonally instead of straight forward. And in a game like DuckTales, Scrooge will tend to crouch in the middle of moving left and right. But overall, I would say this D-pad really isn't that bad. 
and it's certainly not the worst case of this issue that I've ever seen. You might notice it a little bit in certain games, but for the most part it's perfectly functional. And for me personally, the shape and the texture of it more than makes up for this slight issue. In fact, I've actually been playing a game called Bionicle Heroes on the DS on this device. It's a 3D first person shooter in which you use the D-pad and the face buttons to move and aim. And actually this kind of cardinal tilt works perfectly for a game like this, because it gives you a much smoother experience than if you were just locked into those four directions with tough diagonals. Also on the face you have your start and select button, which are clicky switches but thankfully they've been dampened and aren't too loud. This is definitely out of character for Power Kitty because they usually just give you the loudest snappiest buttons they can, but on this one it's a nice muted click, and they feel really nice. The final inputs on the face of the device are the Android hardware keys, and these are basically the same, with a dampened, quiet click, a slightly domed shape, and a glossy texture. We'll talk more about how these work a little bit later on. So now let's talk about the shoulder buttons. I want to reiterate that I think the tilted design of these is absolutely genius. They are so comfortable to hold your fingers on. By far the most comfortable shoulders I've ever used anyway. L1 and R1 are clicky, and actually maybe a little bit louder than the other clicky switches we've seen so far, but they're definitely not too loud. And they have that same nice glossy texture that the other inputs have. And something else I like about these is that you can push in on them from absolutely anywhere from the very top or the very edge, wherever you want, and it will always work. They're stiff enough that you're not accidentally going to push them if you rest your fingers on them, but they're not too heavy that they're too hard to click. And I really think that with the muted clickiness and the great shape and angle, these are absolutely top tier shoulder buttons. As for the triggers, these aren't analog, they're simple digital switches, and they use a rubber membrane connection that's very similar to what's found on the Retroid Pocket 3. So they kind of have a slightly softer feeling, but they're still tactile and kind of clicky. They're angled similar to the shoulders and have a slightly curved shape that supports your finger very well. Again, I think these are absolutely top tier digital triggers. And I have to say that Power Kitty absolutely blew it away with these inputs in particular. Overall, the control layout on the Power Kitty X28 is absolutely excellent, with everything being compact and in reach despite the larger size of the device. But unfortunately, there's no denying that the analog sticks are essentially totally broken and that the D-pad is just a little bit slippy. However, I have to say that the overall comfort, thanks to this control layout, has far outweighed any issues I've had with the analog sticks or D-pad when playing games in general. And I think that this is one of the best control layouts that Power Kitty has ever put out there. Moving on, let's talk about the display. The X28 has a 5.5 inch 720p display with touchscreen capabilities. And it is really nice to see such a large display on a cheaper device like this. It's also the biggest screen that you'll find on a T618 handheld right now. And I have to say that whereas the screen itself didn't blow me away when I first turned it on and I was browsing the Android home screen, in-game I find the colours to be absolutely phenomenal. It's not really oversaturated like a lot of other handhelds are, and the colours just feel really natural and true. It's not the brightest display I've ever seen, but it does get very, very dim, which would make it perfect for playing in darker environments. And the only issue I've had with the brightness is maybe when I'm in completely and utterly direct sunlight, it gets a little bit washed out, but still perfectly usable. The only real issue with this display is the light bleed, because this display has some of the most intense light bleed I've ever seen. Now don't get me wrong, you can rarely see this when you're playing a game, especially one with bright colours, but if you put a black image up on the screen, you're going to see bleed pretty much all around the edges of the display. And I don't think it's a particularly big problem, but it's definitely something to be aware of. Another observation about this screen is I'm not sure what kind of coating they used. It doesn't really feel like a glass screen, it feels more like plastic. And it feels like it picks up fingerprints much, much more than any of the other devices I have, such as my smartphone. I would definitely recommend getting a screen protector for this because it doesn't feel particularly strong. That's just an observation, though I'm not really sure what it's actually made of, but I wouldn't say it's Gorilla Glass or anything like that. But none of these issues are really a huge problem, and overall I just think having this very big 5.5 inch display on such a cheap yet powerful device is just an absolute joy. And everything I play on it looks absolutely stunning. And especially because you get a really big play area whether you're playing 4x3 games, 3x2, or you're filling out the screen completely with 16x9 content. It just looks really, really good overall. So now let's talk about the speakers. And the dual stereo speakers on the X28 are, in general, really, really nice. I would say they lack a little bit of bass, but other than that they're very very clear and they get incredibly loud. And other than just a little bit more bass, I haven't really found myself wanting anything more from these speakers. And just by virtue of having them front facing and stereo, 
means that the X28 has some of the best speakers in the T618 lineup, if not the best. Finally, just a little word on the overall shape of the Paukiti X28. I've already gone over the excellent tilted shoulders, but I want to talk about the grips on the back, because I think that Paukiti absolutely knocked this design out of the park. I think that the angular front combined with the smooth, full grips on the back just make it supremely comfortable. The compact controls are all within reach, it sits in your hand very nicely, and it's very, very lightweight. All of those things combined with the big screen and the nice speakers just make the X28 a really, really lovely experience to play. And that's even considering those pretty hefty flaws that I described earlier with the controls. This is definitely a case of more than the sum of its parts, at least in my opinion. And it's part of why the X28 has become one of my favorite gaming handhelds. But for now, let's go ahead and talk about the operating system. And things get a little weird and a little complicated here, so pay attention. If you buy the X28 from powkitty.com directly, you'll get a version that has Google Play and very little bloatware. That means that the first time you turn on the device, you'll be prompted to sign in with your Google account, and then you'll have full access to the Play Store. You'll still have to deal with PowKitty's absurdly terrible launcher, but you can easily disable that and get into a regular Android home screen, and then replace that with a launcher if you wish. However, if you buy the PowKitty X28 from a reseller or somewhere else, there is a pretty good chance that you're going to get the Chinese version of this device. And that version of the software does not have Google Play, and it's absolutely chock full of Chinese bloatware. And this is just a really disappointing experience out of the box, especially for somebody who doesn't really want to tinker. And it's definitely something to be aware of when you choose to buy this and where you choose to buy it from. I've seen even other YouTubers who have received this device be completely baffled by how to use it and how to navigate it because of the terrible launcher and the Chinese bloatware with a lack of Google Play Store. Thankfully, in another uncharacteristic move for PowerKitty, they have provided both the ability and instructions to reflash the X28 with the Google Play based software that doesn't have all the bloatware. But I don't think a new user who doesn't really know how to do this stuff is really going to be comfortable doing that. So I suppose that's not really a criticism of this device, but it's just something to be aware of. Make sure you buy it from somewhere where you know it's going to have the Google Play Store version by default. Anyway, let's talk about Android itself. Because Android is, well, basically Android. And the X28 comes with a very minimal version. If you're familiar with an Android phone, you're going to have the exact same experience here, more or less. And you can install all the apps that you want, whether it's from the Play Store or elsewhere. And I found that the gamepad works fine in all those situations too. In fact, PowKitty just released a new update that fixes the L2 and R2 buttons in Moonlight Streaming and Minecraft and other games like that. But what I'm saying here is that there's no nasty surprises, but no good surprises either with this Android build. It's very simple, it's very bare bones, and there's not really much to say about it. Android is Android, and it comes with all the complexities and all the conveniences that that comes with. However, that brings me on to the Android native hardware buttons that the X28 has. On the front of the device, you'll find a home button, which will take you back to the home screen, a back button, which triggers Android's natural back function, an app switcher button, which opens the app switcher, and finally, a G button for using PowerKitty's gamepad mapper, which we'll talk about a bit later. And having these buttons on the front of the device is a godsend, because it makes using Android so much more convenient. Because you don't need to swipe up or left or right on the screen to do basic tasks. You can just hit one of these buttons instead. And I have to say that whereas this seems like a really simple and minor thing, these Android native hardware buttons elevate the X28's Android experience to one of the best in class I've ever used, because it's just so darn easy to navigate. You never need to touch the screen unnecessarily on the X28. The interface itself can be navigated with the controls, and then Android functions like going home, back, or opening the app switcher can be done using these buttons. It is extremely convenient, very easy to use, and I absolutely love it. One last thing to note on the software here is that custom firmware is most likely in the very, very near future, because the now legendary Gamma Squeeze has been working on the X28 over the last couple of days. So I'm really, really excited to see what he can bring to the table as well. And so finally, it's time to talk about gaming on the PowKitty X28. Starting with Android games. Now these are the games that you're going to be downloading from the Google Play Store. And whereas the results that I got with Android gaming were a bit of a mixed bag, I have to say I'm pretty impressed overall. Now one thing to bear in mind when it comes to Android gaming is that whereas the T618 processor is a pretty decent one as far as retro handhelds go, 
It's actually a very low-end chip, especially in comparison to modern smartphones. And so it's important to bear that in mind when setting your expectations for Android gaming. However, there were plenty of games that I thought weren't going to run at all that actually ended up running very, very well. Even top-end titles such as Asphalt 9, Modern Combat 5, and then easier titles such as Grim Valor, and a couple of my favourites, Revenant Knight and Pocket Rally. All of the aforementioned games ran very, very well on the X28, and I had no issues with the controls working either. And part of the reason for that is that Powkitty just released a system update that fixes the L2 and R2 buttons that were kind of broken in some games before. But yeah, on the whole, most games that I tried seemed to run pretty well, but there were a few that didn't. One that especially surprised me was Limbo, because Limbo kind of ran just in slow motion for some reason. I don't really consider this a high-end game, so this is kind of confusing. However, of course, I know that the game that most people are going to be interested in right now is Genshin Impact. And, well, I wouldn't necessarily call Genshin Impact playable on this device. What you can do is lower all of the graphic settings down to the absolute minimum, and you'll get something resembling a playable game. It's not the worst experience it could possibly be, but it's certainly not very enjoyable either. First of all, the usually beautiful graphics just don't look very nice at all. There's a lot of jaggedy lines and pixelation, and the moment that you walk into some densely populated area or somewhere with a lot of trees or a lot of enemies, it will start to stutter pretty heavily. And overall, the game will run at 20 FPS or below at all times. So this definitely isn't a very good way to play this game in particular, but I mean, I would say that in a pinch that you're just desperate to play, you probably wouldn't have the worst time here. And Genshin is the perfect opportunity to introduce the X28's gamepad mapper. Simply press the G button on the front of the device to bring up the gamepad mapper. Now this isn't the most robust that I've ever seen, and it lacks a few important features. But for most normal use cases and something like Genshin Impact, it works extremely well. All you have to do is drag your controls around, position each button on screen, and then press the Save Hide button to save your configuration. And as you can see, the controls work really well in this game. And I have to say, this is the easiest gamepad mapper I've ever had the pleasure of using. It is so darn convenient to just have one physical button on the front of the device, that you can use to bring up the mapper and dismiss it again. It means that you can rapidly change your configuration without having to swipe all over the screen or do anything like that. And in general, I really, really love this feature and I love having it mapped to a physical button on the device. And now it's time to talk about emulation. The T618 is a very capable processor when it comes to emulation, but I have to say right now that I do not believe it is an appropriate choice for GameCube and PlayStation 2 gaming. I recently ran a poll on Twitter asking, can the T618 play GameCube and PS2? And the result was a complete 50-50 split with 30 votes. And I think that just kind of sums up the T618 situation with GameCube and PS2. In my personal opinion, this device cannot play GameCube and PS2 games, but some people will argue that maybe you can play some here or there. And that is certainly true. For example, Sonic Heroes here is a game that seems to run completely fine. A little bit of slow down here or there, but for the most part it's an enjoyable experience. But every single other game that I tried on this device was a subpar experience and not something I would call playable. Take something like Need for Speed Underground 2. If you're just looking at the screen, then maybe it looks like it's not too bad. But turn up the volume and... Yeah, this doesn't sound good at all. And the same applies for PlayStation 2, but even worse. The performance on basically every PS2 game I tried was absolutely atrocious, except for a simple 2D game like Odin Sphere, which ran, well, pretty much fine. But the fact of the matter is that the T618 processor just is not powerful enough to play the vast majority of GameCube and PlayStation 2 games. And this is especially true for the Powkitty X28, because its overall performance is lower overall than all of the other T618 lineup which means that games that might work on the other devices are probably not going to work here. Now, I'm not somebody who usually goes into benchmarks and all of that, and if you want to see the disparity in performance between this and a couple of other devices, check out my friend Rob the Retro Tech Dad's review as well, because he goes into quite a lot of detail on this fact. So, GameCube and PS2, in my opinion, are almost entirely off the table for this device. And just to be even more of a killjoy here, 3DS is similar. I got absolutely abysmal performance in every 3DS game I tried, and this is even when I went out and found the new Vulcan build of Citra, which should have much, much improved performance, it was still terrible across the board. So for high-end emulation, the X28 just isn't going to cut it. But don't be too disappointed, because you're going to see that despite that, 
the X28 is still a fantastic emulation device. So let's go back in time to 2D systems. Every 2D system under the sun is going to run absolutely perfect on the X28. That includes arcade, Game Boy, Super Nintendo, Sega Mega Drive, and especially 2D devices with wider screens. For example, the Game Boy Advance, and in particular, the Wonderswan Color, which just looks fantastic on the X28's gigantic screen. All of these systems are gonna play absolutely perfectly out of the box with no tweaking required. And you still have performance left on the table to apply filters or anything else that you want to make the image quality look exactly like you want it to. Moving up to 3D systems, the PlayStation is a console that is completely conquered by the X28. You can play every single game on PS1 either at native resolution or upscaled to 720p with widescreen applied and it looks and plays absolutely fantastic. PlayStation 1 is kind of potato level emulation at this point so I'm not surprised. Moving on to the next 3D system, Sega Saturn. And once again this is a system that performs absolutely amazing on the X28. You can even upscale it to 720p without any issues in any games whatsoever. And you can play your favorites like Knights into Dreams, Sega Touring Car Championship, or Panzer Dragoon 2 with no issues whatsoever. The next heavy hitting 3D system is the Nintendo 64, and it's another system that runs tremendously well on the X28. For the most part, you'll have no issues playing pretty much any game even upscaled to 720p. But there may be a couple of games that start to have a few stutters here and there. But in those cases, you can just lower the resolution a tiny bit, and you'll be good as gold. However, all that said, there wasn't a single game that I tried at 720p that wasn't perfectly playable, including the likes of Wave Race and Star Wars Rogue Squadron. Moving up to the next generation with the Sega Dreamcast, once again, we have a perfect experience on the X28. And I can't stress that enough with Dreamcast, it's basically perfect. You can apply widescreen hacks, 720p upscaling, and every single game, even the heavier games like Sonic Adventure 2 or Crazy Taxi run absolutely perfectly. No slowdown, no stuttering, nothing whatsoever. The X28 plays Dreamcast games with ease. And one of the absolute best systems to play on the X28 is of course the PlayStation Portable. PSP games for the most part will run upscale to 720p. Nearly every single game I would say. But a few of the heaviest hitting titles, of course God of War and Killzone Liberation may require you to downscale it to 2x PSP resolution instead. And the games still look absolutely fantastic this way as well. In fact, even when you just play them at 1x resolution, they will run absolutely perfectly and they still look great on the X28. However, that's just the high-end games. Pretty much everything below that that I've tried, I can upscale the overwhelming majority of PSP games to 720p with no issues whatsoever and they will be a flawless experience. And one last system I want to mention here is Nintendo DS because it's absolutely wonderful on the X28. If you want to play it in dual screen mode, there's plenty of room to have the screen side by side or have the main screen bigger and the touch screen smaller, and you'll still have plenty of room to tap the screen when needed. Or of course, if you want to fill out the display with the primary screen completely, it looks absolutely fantastic. As I mentioned earlier, I've been playing Bionicle Heroes on this device, and it is just super fun to play a low res FPS like this on the X28. And even big titles like Mario Kart DS and Okami Dan run flawlessly without any issues whatsoever. Of course, the form factor of the Nintendo DS means that not all games will be suitable, for example, something like Sonic Rush. But still, I mean, this is just really, really great on the X28 and performance isn't even a consideration. Everything runs perfectly, even with high resolution rendering enabled. So sure, the X28 can't quite reach the heights of the GameCube and PS2. However, I would argue that it was never supposed to. This chip can basically launch the emulators and play a few games, but it's really not powerful enough to emulate those systems. But absolutely everything else that the X28 should be able to play within reason, it does so absolutely perfectly. And I mean in a pick up and play way. For everything from your 2D systems, PS1, all the way up through Dreamcast and PSP, there is absolutely no tinkering required to play the overwhelming majority of all of the games on all of those systems. And I think this is part of why the X28 is just such an appealing device to me. Because for anything Dreamcast, PSP and below, I can just pick it up, select the game that I want to play, and in 99.99% of cases, it is going to run flawlessly and look fantastic. Approximately none of my time is going to be spent trying to get these games to work, and all of my time is going to be spent enjoying playing the game on this big and lovely screen regardless of what I'm playing. And so overall when it comes to emulation, the X28 just blows it out of the water. It's absolutely perfect for everything Dreamcast, PSP and below. And as long as you temper your expectations to not include systems that this chip was never supposed to play, 
you are going to have an absolutely fantastic time with the X28. And it is truly what I would describe as a pick up and play device. It just simply works. So that rounds out the emulation section of this video, so let's talk about some of the additional features that the X28 has to offer. Notably, HDMI output and controller support. Just pop in a cable and it will appear on the external screen. No unnecessary steps needed. And when it comes to controller support, any wired or wireless controller with Android support will work just fine. Similarly, other peripherals like keyboards, mice, and even, say, a printer if you really wanted to, will work on the X28 because of that Android operating system. The gyroscope also works perfectly, as does the vibration function in both Android games and emulation. It even has a microphone, and the quality isn't really great, but it might work for some voice chat here and there. I should also mention that you can charge this device, as well as having a peripheral plugged in, thanks to the dual USB port setup. In general, this device is just as flexible as any other Android device, and I've had no nasty surprises when it comes to using these additional features at all. Everything just kind of works. So let's talk a little bit about the battery life on the X28, because that's one of its best features in my opinion. The battery life while you're playing a game will of course vary depending on what game you're playing, but you can typically expect between 8 and 10 hours of battery life in general, all thanks to that gigantic 5000 mAh battery. But where that really, really stands out is in the standby, because the X28 has just phenomenal standby battery life. Recently, I took a trip to Amsterdam, and I had the Powkitty X28 in my bag the entire time on standby, and it was still alive with about 20% battery left. This is easily a device you can just leave on your countertop for days at a time, and come back to and still be able to play. And I really think this is part of why I've played the X28 just so much over the last couple of months. It's replaced basically every other handheld I have right now, simply because I can just pick it up at any time and play. It always seems to have battery life left after it's been left out for a while. It really is fantastic. Something that's not so fantastic is that you can't charge it with a USB-C to USB-C cable again. In fact, the X28 only charges at 1.5 amps, and this is incredibly slow. I really, really think it's time that these devices supported fast charging, or at least USB-C to USB-C cables. I don't mind so much leaving this thing on charge overnight, but I would much prefer to be able to charge it up 50% in an hour if I could. But it's just not possible here, it just takes a really long time to charge. So it's kind of a toss up with the X28 with its excellent standby battery life but extra long charging time. Speaking of traveling around with the X28, I also have the official carrying case. And it's pretty good overall. The size is absolutely perfect for holding the X28 securely. And then you have plenty of room to stick a USB cable or any other accessories too. Now I'm not somebody that needs to keep my carrying cases looking pristine all the time. After all, they're supposed to be thrown around. But I do notice that the Pow Kitties case did seem to get dented and scuffed very, very quickly. But again, I don't really mind that. However, something I do think that could be improved with this case is that it's just so darn thick. It's more than double the thickness of the X28, and I just think that's kind of unnecessary. I would much prefer a slimmer case that had less room for accessories. Because honestly, what else am I going to carry with this? I can't really think of anything except a USB cable, and I have plenty of those to just throw into the bottom of my bag. But anyway, it's fine and I'm glad I have it. I like the Pow Kitty logo on the front, and I like the carrying handle too. Well, I have been at this review for absolutely ages, so I suppose it's time to wrap everything up, and let you know my overall thoughts, likes, and dislikes on the Pow Kitty X28. And like I said earlier, this is kind of a confusing situation because I'll be the first to admit that the X28 has some pretty major flaws, including the honestly totally broken analog sticks, the very slippery D-pad, and also something I should mention before I finish the video, is that this is among the worst performing T618 devices out there right now, as well as the confusing setup between the Chinese and Google Play version of Android that your device may or may not come with. And especially as it pertains to those analog sticks, this is pretty darn close to being an actual fault, not just a flaw. But even taking all that into consideration, it still hasn't killed the Pow Kitty X28 for me. In fact, this has become my number one device. Over the last two months that I've had it, I've played it more than anything else that I own, I've played it more often than I usually play retro handhelds, and I think I've gotten more enjoyability out of it too. And it's simply because the design is just flawless. It has an extremely lightweight, making it easy to toss around into a bag and take out and about with you. It plays absolutely everything it should be able to play within reasonable expectations, with absolutely no tinkering and no issues and no stuttering or slowdown. And the battery life is just phenomenal, especially the standby life. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, so let me go ahead and sum up everything, 
starting with my likes. And there are too many of these to really list, but I'll start out with the design. The design of the X28 is sublime. The tilted shoulder buttons, the compact controls, the comfort in the hands, everything seems to be absolutely perfect. At least for me personally. Next up is the screen. And I can't deny that having a device with a big screen like this is just a really enjoyable experience. No matter what you're playing, you can see it perfectly and you get plenty of game area. And with 16x9 content, it just looks fantastic. Next up is the performance. Everything that the X28 should be able to play within reason, it does so with absolutely no problems at all. And that's often even when it's upscaled to 720p. Next up is the weight. And the lightweight of the X28 is noticeable whether you're carrying it around with you or it's in your hands and you're playing on it. It's just really nice to have such a light device of this size. And actually, I think the X28 has made me think that I would prefer a lighter device with worse build quality than a heavier device with better build quality at this point. Next up is the face button and D-pads. I love the glossy texture, and even though the D-pad's a bit slippery, I found it perfectly usable for anything I've wanted to play. The stereo speakers. They sound great, they get very loud, and whereas I would prefer a little bit more bass, I think they're perfectly usable. Next up is the flexibility because of the Android operating system. I really like Android handhelds. Your mileage may vary depending on what you think about them, but I really like it here. Another thing I like or rather love about the X28 is its battery life, especially the standby battery life. I can't believe this thing can last like a week on standby. It's absolutely incredible. And finally for my last like, I just kind of want to generalize and say the overall experience of owning this device. It's just a really pleasing device. It's nice and big. It's got a big screen. It's light in weight. The controls are decent. It's really easy to just throw around into a bag or anywhere else. I don't know, I probably shouldn't put this on my likes, but I just really, really like this device and I just wanted to reiterate that. And now for my dislikes, and of course the biggest one is gonna be the broken analog sticks. No matter how much I like the X28, there's no denying that the analog sticks are quite literally broken. They should really not be behaving the way that they do, Especially the broken down left direction on mine is kind of unforgivable. And it's a flaw that shouldn't be there at all. I mean, I've never had a device, even super cheap devices, where the analog sticks behave like this. It really is not okay. Next up is the 64 gigs of onboard storage. I didn't mention this earlier in the video, but I did run into some issues where I ran out of storage space, and that's just not a very good experience. This isn't going to be an issue if you're only doing emulation and you have an SD card. But for anything native Android, I just don't really think that 64 gigs is enough anymore. And I'd much prefer for it to be 128 instead. Next is the screen coating. Maybe this is just me, but I feel like the screen coating on the X28 just doesn't feel very robust. I don't think it's glass, and if it is, it doesn't feel particularly sturdy. And it seems to pick up fingerprints like crazy. I think this is an issue that would be resolved just by using a screen protector. I just haven't got one yet. Next, I have to mention the confusing Android experience. Depending on whether you buy this direct or from a reseller or wherever else, there's just no knowing which version you're going to get. And if you don't end up with the Google Play version out of the box, you're going to have to put in some real work to get Google Play on there. It's not something that's difficult to do, but it's not something I would expect an end user should have to do in the first place. Another dislike I have to mention, of course, is the backwards volume keys. Please, Powkitties, stop doing this. It is so frustrating. Another dislike is the slow charging speed, because it is really, really noticeable. I just honestly don't think that in 2023, a device like this should take four to five hours to charge up. It's kind of ridiculous, regardless of how great the battery life itself is. And my final dislike is just the inconsistent performance on Android native games. Now, I don't mind this too much because I don't really play many of them, but there were certainly games that I expected to perform better and they performed a lot worse. But the opposite was also true. Games I didn't expect to work at all ran very well. So it's just kind of inconsistent. Not a huge deal as far as I'm concerned, because I'm mostly playing retro games here. So that wraps up my likes and dislikes on the Powkitty X28. In the end, I think the Powkitty X28 is a very flawed device that still manages to overcome those flaws by just getting so much right and being an overall extremely enjoyable experience. And like I've said a few times in this video, I've played this device more than any other. I play it more often than I did other retro handholds. And I just really, really love it overall. I think the X28 is solidified for me as one of my favorite retro handhelds of all time. Not because it's perfect, not because it's without flaw, but just because everything when it's in your hands and you're playing is just a really, really nice experience. Put all that together and consider it's a $150 shipped price, and I think that the Powkitty X28 is just a really, really excellent handheld for the money. Just make sure you temper your expectations to not include GameCube or PS2. So now it's time to tell me what you think about the Powkitty X28. Do you have one or are you going to order one? 
Do you have a different T618 device that you prefer? Please let me know in the comment box down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you're interested in buying a Powkitty X28 for yourself, I'll leave a link in the description box below to powkitty.com, as well as MechDIY, who sent me this one. And that's this one done. So thank you very much for watching Retrobreeze, and I look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you.